Donald Trump showed up in New York pretty fired up, as was his expert witness that we're going to hear from during today's testimony. Eli Bartov, a professor of accounting, was there. And at one point during an exchange, right before the lunch break, Klasfeld says that the AG blasted his testimony when he was on the stand, said, Your Honor, this guy's purely speculative, and he's just been hired to say whatever it is Trump's team wants. But Bartov snapped back at Tishy and her lawyers and said, You make up allegations that never existed. You should be ashamed of yourself talking to me like that. Ooh, so it's a spicy day, right? That's the witness. We'll get into his full testimony. But Trump was there and he had several comments as well. We also had a very brief opinion come out from the Supreme Court of New York. We'll take a look at that. But you can see Trump was there inside the courtroom. And before he even walked in the courtroom, he had a little something to say to the press and to the media. And so we'll take a look at what he said here. You can see he's flanked by Alina Ava on his left. On his right is Christopher Keese. And he's speaking with a whole cadre of people standing there behind him saying we're going in in this trial brought by Tishy Latish James and he's fired up ready to go. Here's what it sounds like. Top people right under the attorney general put him into the district attorney's office also put a man into the state attorney general's office Leticia James office happened to be the same man. This is coming right from the White House. This is a disgraceful situation in the country. Never seen anything like it but this expert witness highly respected by everybody with a resume that few people have ever seen before said there was no fraud there was no accounting fraud there was nothing and this is what we're doing here while people are being murdered right outside on the sidewalks and the streets in of new, new york, york. people are nice job. experiencing horrible violent crime at levels that nobody's ever seen in the city before this is what the attorney general is spending all the time on so just to put it finally he's going to continue to testify but i don't imagine he's going to be changing his uh, basic statement his finding is that there was no accounting fraud whatsoever the statements that we put in were very conservative they were the opposite of what they said the accounting fraud and the fraud was on behalf of the judge and the attorney general who took assets and made them numbers that were fraudulent as an example mar-a-lago as an example doral in miami as an example 40 wall street and others, where they cut the values to a level that nobody's even imagined. You take a look at Doral and look at the numbers that we're talking about for Doral. But the most obvious of all, because of the fact that people know it, is when you value a place like Mar-a-Lago at $18 million, when it's worth anywhere from 50 to 100 times that amount. We had an expert witness in the other day. He's the biggest broker in the country for luxury properties. I guess he's that the yesterday. ultimate expert, actually. And he valued Mar-a-Lago at over a billion dollars. And the judge valued it at 18 million. The judge doesn't know the value of Mar-a-Lago. 18 and the million. the attorney general is the one that convinced the judge to say that. Uh, it's a fraud. The whole case is a fraud. What they've done is they've weaponized justice. And this is coming from the White House. Because I'm beating Biden by a lot. That's true. And not happy this about is coming that. right out of the White House. You know it. I know it. And they know it. So just to end this, the expert would this one of the most highly respected people in the country for doing this kind of work. Absolutely no accounting fraud. This case should be ended. Also, the judge, as you know, was rebuked in that he was overturned by the appellate division of the New York State Supreme Court, which is a higher court, a much higher court than where we are right now. The judge refused to acknowledge it. This case would be over because that was about 90% of the case having to do with statute of limitations. This case should be over. This case should have never been brought. This was a political witch hunt by an attorney general who's out of control, who ran for uh, tried to get elected governor and failed. Yep. But this is a political witch hunt, and our country should be ashamed of what's going on. But we will probably go forward, and I'm sure nothing will have any bearing on what this judge does. It's a very sad day for our country because people are coming in, we can say this every day, and we are totally innocent. This is weaponization of justice. This is something that nobody's ever seen to this extent. It's called election interference. It's a sad day for our country that a thing like this can take place. I'm sitting in a courthouse instead of being in Iowa, where I should be, even though I'm leading by about 40 points. Thank you very much. Well, you to do the All right, so big statement from Trump right there, about four minutes, and he was lacing into everybody, right? This is shameful, and I couldn't agree with him more. It is weaponized attacks by the legal system against him. And this is just one venue. There's many others, including the four criminal charges. That 
that are spattered around the country. So that is what Trump said outside the courtroom. We also have a little scene inside the courtroom from cameras that were there. And we always look for Tishy to see if we can identify if she's there or where her caboose is. Comments that are worthy of analysis, which we'll get to in just a moment. At stake here, There's $250 Trump. million dollars, at least, and control of his business empire. $250 million is how much New York right, Attorney General go Letitia James Tishy? wants Trump and his sons to pay right, after now, they were found. They get scooted out of there. All right, so there's Trump in there with the signature red tie, looking good, looking strong. And they were there today while this guy was testifying. His name is Eli Bartov. Nice looking gentleman. Here is a little bit of background from him, from the bio on his website. This is from NYU Stern, biography from this guy. Joined Stern back in 1992. See a little bit of a photograph there. You see that he's the professor of accounting at New York University's Stern School of Business. He's an award-winning researcher and teacher, and he's an internationally recognized scholar. Pretty good witness. Now, his research focuses on financial reporting, executive compensation, the role of social media, forensic accounting, stock price formation, mergers and acquisitions, and so on, right? Here is his list of uh, qualifications, different awards, selected publications. Yeah, nice job here, right? So he's got some good stuff out there, and he's obviously somebody qualified as an expert. So let's take a look and see what happened in the testimony. And we've got a couple different transcripts here, X scripts from Klasfeld Reports. Klasfeld Reports, you can follow at Klasfeld Reports on the X platform. And here is what he said happened today in New York. He says, all right, Trump arrives in court, says he's looking slightly downcast. He looked pretty good to me. Now, minutes before the proceeding began, he said he walked straight to the defense table and he's flanked by his lawyers, sat down next to Alina Abba and Christopher Keese. He said Trump just made a makeshift press conference outside the courtroom before entering. We heard some of that. But now Eli Bartoff enters the courtroom and takes the stand. Now, Bartoff's testimony begins with a description. He says, yeah, I'm very qualified, as you can see here. Got a lot of stuff, a lot of background here. I do all sorts of accounting, mergers, evaluations. I'm a smart guy. I'm a professor. Now, as we await the substance of his testimony, he says it was involved in a pretrial deposition. Okay, so this guy was already somebody who's been interviewed by Tishy's prosecutors and says that he testified at a pretrial deposition saying that he backs Trump's case, saying that financial statements are inherently subjective, right? There's differences of opinions about how these things work. There's not one person's objective take of a person's financial status. Trump has a position on his financial status. So does the bank. They're able to midway and come to terms, which is exactly what they did. But Tishy's saying, no, it, her interpretation is better than the two private parties because she's a government person and that's how they think. So the word subjective appears in Bartov's affidavit 28 times. So Klasfeld has a copy of it and says the New York AG says that Trump fraudulently inflated those financial statements, right? Now Trump's experts say, no, he didn't. He undervalued it. And Trump's experts have generally argued that he had broad latitude on valuations. Okay, Trump can make his claim. The other guys can make an opposite claim. Now the New York Attorney General's response to all of this is that these things are not subjective, okay? Says Trump's New York penthouse, the size of it is an objective fact, is what she says. And the existence of third-party appraisals is another objective fact. Well, maybe the existence is, but again, you also could have disputes about property sizes, okay? This is usable space. This is not usable space. This is undercover. This is not, right? There's like generally accepted principles and practices, and other people might have different valuations of things. That's why it's called a valuation. That's why you have people who are appraisers. Anyways, so this is how Angeron, he says, characterized it previously. This was yesterday. And Angeron said, look, I don't care about whether properties are overvalued or undervalued. This was Angeron's own statement because Trump's expert came in the day prior to this expert and said that actually Trump undervalued these properties, right? He actually got loaned, for example, based on collateral of 500 million. Let's say it was Mar a Lago at the time, but actually it was worth 650. So Trump undervalued it. And Engron says, well, I don't even care about the valuation. Only thing I care about is whether documents were fraudulent or not because valuation, he might lose the case. So he needs to find something else to hang his hat on. So then the judge is saying, all right, you know, he's going back through his credentials. He's saying, I'm highly qualified. The judge is like, I still don't know if you're an expert yet or if you're just a Trump hack or something. But the judge continues and finally he gets qualified qualifications and distinctions that's where we are right now in Bartov's testimony we may be here for a while he says and so he's going through that whole CV so then they say all right Trump's lawyer finally gets to it and says how many times have you served as an expert witness before Mr. Bartov he says gosh I don't know 16 maybe 18 times been a long time and then the government wants to chime in okay so they're laying this foundation and then the government says your honor I'd like to avoid the ear of this guy he says he's an expert 
expert, but I want to know if he's an expert about these issues. The judge says, perfect, dig into it. So then Tishy's government prosecutor says, Lewis Solomon, his name is Lewis. He says, all right here, Eli, I want to know, have you ever helped banks make a credit decision? Have you ever worked on the opposite end, like for a big conglomerate bank or something? He says, no. He says, well, then I'm going to object to Bartov being qualified as an expert on any credit analysis, since he's never helped a bank form a credit opinion, therefore he's not qualified. And the judge says, well, all right, well, I think he's pretty close. He says, I'm going to actually, I am going to qualify him on financial accounting and credit analysis. Okay. Just because he didn't help a bank doesn't mean he can't qualify. So he obviously knows that there's some bar here. He says, hey, he's got some qualifications. He's credentialed enough. So then Angeron says, and by the way, the reason I'm going to let him in is because there's no jury here. He says, I'm, you know, he's thinking to himself already rule against Trump anyway. So what do I care? But says, so there's a much lower bar for admissibility. So your objections noted, I'll take that into account. So then question begins. Once the foundation is laid, he says, okay, you're qualified as an expert witness. And now he comes in. Trump's lawyer says, Mr. Bardoff, you did a bunch of investigation on this case, right? Yeah. And you prepared a big fat report for us. Yeah. Can you just summarize us for us all? What is your main finding of everything that you've done here today? And this is something that lawyers will do, right? They'll start at the top. What's the final line? And then they'll unpack the whole thing. What did you conclude? Bartop says, well, my main finding is that there is no evidence whatsoever of any accounting fraud. Nice job. Perfectly done. Okay. Right answer. No evidence whatsoever of any accounting fraud. And that was the judge's big hangup. He doesn't care about valuations. He cares about financial documents. He said Trump's statements, Trump's interpretation of what he's worth is fraudulent. This guy says, not at all. No evidence whatsoever. Dude's qualified. What do you mean? Can you explain, Eli? He says, certainly. So I went through his report and I looked at a bunch of things and I couldn't find a single gap provision that was violated. We know gap from prior testimony is generally accepted accounting principles. I couldn't find one. Everything looked good. He says, in fact, evidence shows that Trump estimated that the square footage of his New York penthouse at roughly the three times its size, right? And Bartov says, because they're drawing the sting out now. So Trump's attorneys are saying, you said there's no errors, there's no violations. There's nothing wrong that was fraudulent, right? No violations of gap. But what about this thing that Tishy keeps complaining about? This idea that he's got a bunch of overly estimated square footage, for example, in New York. What about that? It's three times the size. Isn't that fraud? And Bartov says, well, no, I mean, I looked into that property. Obviously, it's a triplex. The price was inflated. There's no question about that. But he says, that's just an error. Okay, that's just an error. And, you know, errors like that are not unusual. So I'm not even worried about it. Okay, well, errors happen all the time, right? It's complicated accounting. So then there's a morning recess and we're back. Now, Adam continues reporting and let's pause and see if we get any other Trump statements. He's sitting in court and he comes out and he says, hey, we just got this really nice ruling. We'll take a quick look at it and see if we can unpack it. But here's Trump during one of the breaks. Talent Division, New York State, just gave us a very good ruling. Appreciate it. I think the country appreciates it. Businesses are watching this case. No business will move back into New York. No business will, frankly, stay in New York. A lot of businesses are talking about leaving New York because of this action. It's a very serious action because it's a Marxist type of or form of trying to steal your business, trying to take your money away from you that you worked for many, many years and your assets away. So we were just given, I think it's a great thing for the country, a very strong decision by the appellate division just came down this moment, so you'll look that decision up. It's very powerful. I want to also mention the expert witness who's so highly respected is on the Nobel Prize Committee for various things having to do with finance. Wow. I think that's very good. Yeah. But he's a very strong witness, a very powerful witness, and a highly respected person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trump. All right, walking back into court after another recess. Everybody's piling back in. All right, and so we'll get back into the afternoon session, but let's first take a look at what he mentioned there about that appellate ruling. So I had a couple things on this. First of all, we did pull up the ruling, but there's not much information in it. So we're gonna see what this report tells us. This is from Lisa Rubin. She actually dug into this. She says, a New York appeals court continues the stay of Angeron's order that canceled Trump's business certificates. Okay, so there's different counts, there's different claims here. One of the things that Angeron did is canceled Trump's business certificates. He said, you can't do that. 
we got a you know business operating in New York. And so part of the ruling is staying the cancellation, so putting on hold the cancellation of the business certificates, but denies other relief that was granted to the attorney general after its summary judgment, widespread fraud in the financial statements. So in other words, it sounds like it's mostly maintaining the status quo, right? And it's not really adjusting things too much while the appeals continues. And this is really what it looks like when we take a look at the document. This is from the Supreme Court of the state of New York. So you see this one literally just came out, right? Trump was sitting in court and this is what he was talking about, 9.53 in the morning. And so it comes back down from the attorneys and you know, he's happy that the cancellation of the business certificates is not reversed, right? It's like, okay, cool. So things are still status quo, good. So you can see this is Tishy Latish and people of the state of New York versus Trump and everybody else of the Trump organization, including Ivanka Trump as the defendant and says here, appeals having been taken to this court from the orders of the Supreme Court, the New York entered back in September and on October 5th says Trump, the defendant appellants moved to stay the enforcement of the orders. They wanted to stop the orders and a stay of the trial pending a hearing and determination of the appeals. Okay, so the trial is obviously not going to be stayed. We're in the middle of it. Now, upon reading and the filing of the papers with respect to the motion and due deliberation having been had thereon from the Court of Appeals, in this case, the Supreme Court there, it is ordered that the motion is granted to the extent of continuing pending and hearing determination of the appeals, the interim relief granted by a justice of this court and is otherwise denied. So like, most of the status quo, it looks like is staying the same and Trump is happy about that because they could have reversed it and come back you know, down upon him. And so that is what the order looks like. Lisa Rubin explains what this means practically is that the provisions of the below order are enforceable and that if Judge Jones is the agreed upon receiver of these businesses, right? Once the businesses are canceled and stuff, then stuff happens to it. Then Trump and his co-defendants are going to owe her a bunch of information and advance notice about that later on. So it sounds like it's preserving things for the most part. And Trump is happy about that maintenance. So that is what is happening there. Now he says this clip, he says, we want it the appellate division. And then we'll jump into the afternoon session. This is where Trump is speaking about the sham charges and the witch hunt that's taking place there in Tishy Letitia's. Something wrong here. We won this case. Remember this. Just put it in your heads. This case was won at the appellate division. And the judge refuses to do what the appellate division demands he do. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. When you win at the appellate division, that's your high court. The judge has to be bound by what their decision is. But we won at the appellate division. Part of that victory was Ivanka, of course, not having to put herself through this. And they ruled that. But the bigger part of it was that about 90% because of statute of limitations, about 90% of the case disappears. So remember this, we won the case at the appellate division, the high court, and this judge refuses to acknowledge that victory or that demand. Now that's very serious. So we're going in now, we have an expert witness, one of the great experts in the country, and I hope you'll all be able to listen to him, but it'll just be another day. If you look at the case, we did nothing wrong, there were no victims, the bank loves us, the bank testified, they love us, we did absolutely nothing wrong, we never even defaulted, we never had a default letter sent to us, the bank said we were a perfect customer, the bank didn't even know why they were here, and yet you have people being murdered outside, all over the streets they're being murdered, this violent crime, and this attorney general who's great, she's a lunatic, the attorney general sits here because she knows that she has a judge and no matter all the evidence, that judge is going to rule in her favor. He ruled against me before the case even started. The case hadn't started. He knew nothing and he ruled against me. The other thing is this. He valued Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, Florida because that was good for her case. At a value of $18 million when in fact it's worth anywhere from 50 to 100 times that amount. Nobody's ever seen anything like it, but just remember what I said at the beginning. We wanted the appellate division, and this judge refuses to honor that victory or that decision or that demand. Mr. George, why did you say you would be back here? Did you watch the Why did you say you would be back here?
All right, Trump did a great job there explaining this expert. Alina did a great job also supporting him. And so this is what it looked like there outside the courtroom. Now, that was from the morning session, so those clips were reversed there. But let's take a look now at the afternoon session and see what happened there from Klasfeld reports. We do have some continuation here. Now, before the lunch break, something went down. The AG's counsel yelled. One of these lawyers over here for Tishy, who I don't see in the courtroom back there, said something like, Your Honor, this Eli Bartoff guy is just someone they hire to say whatever it is they want. He's not even honest. How do we know that? Is because Eli Bartoff got half a million dollars. Woo, that's some nice super chat, man. It pays to be an expert, you know what I'm saying? So they paid roughly half a million bucks, 520 grand, maybe a little less. You know, sometimes you have to round up, but that's a nice chunk of change. And so they bring this out, right, to go in and say that this person is biased. They're just being paid off. They're just paid hacks, which is always curious to me because it's interesting. It's like, hey, aren't these people, isn't their entire salary coming from the government, right? And isn't their entire position now to prosecute Trump, which is what their boss wants them to do. So they're kind of like captive, you know, like they say that expert witness for the defense are like captive sheep or something, you know, like they are just little immoral, lacking in integrity people who just get paid off. But these people are sucking at the government's teat every day, every day, every day. And so if Tishy says you prosecute Trump because that's what my campaign requires, they got to do it, man. They're as biased as anybody, right? And they're political as well. And, you know, for some reason that never feels like it's a conflict of interest or anything, but whatever. All right, so this is what happens here. So Bartov, he swore in an affidavit that he's making $13.50 an hour, which is nice. And he spent 250 hours on this expert report and 150 hours on the rebuttal report. He says, well, a little bit less. And you know, those hours were probably inexact. Here's a question from the depot. Hey, Eli, how much money did you make on this case, man? A lot? And he said, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, so maybe, you know, maybe another 25 or 30 hours, maybe. I think, you know, I include it with the 400 hours, but I think overall, yeah, I spent about 400 hours, okay? Everything included up to today. And so just in rough math, that's what, about $520,000? He's like, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of money, okay? I did a lot. So if it costs this one guy half a million bucks to investigate this case, how much do you think it costs for all of these knuckleheads over here? All of these government bureaucrats, these prosecutors, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then some, right? They've all got assistants and staff and they've got, you know, just gobs of government benefits and healthcare and dental and all these things and paid vacation, like 100 million holidays off. They're government bureaucrats, all right? So what is it costing them to review all of this? Like they all know the details of Trump and you know, obviously they're not you know being billed at 13.50 an hour, but it's a lot of resources, right? So Trump obviously has to spend some money in order to get somebody to come in and review all the materials. So they try to turn it into a big something. You can see we're spending a lot of time on it here, but that doesn't include any compensation since July. And so Bartov, he says, he's taking the stand. Bartov is sitting there and the attorney general gets up and they, they're taking Calling this whole thing up, right? They got their calculator. And like, don't you make this much money? And they're just bitter as hell because they're mostly miserable with their lives because they work for the government, which is like this self kind of perpetuating slow motion disaster because they kind of, you know, become like embedded with the government. Like they kind of morph into it almost like the Borg, you know, it's hard to like unplug yourself. So they just hate it that somebody's an expert and they're making more money than them in the private sector. And so they tallied up all the things they put up and you're making this much money. And so they said, so just the rough mass is 520,000. And he says back to them, you're quite the mathematician there, buddy. Nice job. They teach you that at prosecutor school to use a calculator. Wow. So then he tallied up the hours and his rate and he calculates like, yeah, yeah, good job. You know how to use an Excel spreadsheet? Congratulations. <laughs> so then as of least of last July, he says, yeah, all my compensation has been paid. I've been paid. Obviously Trump pays his bills. All right. This isn't a, what do you think we're dealing with here? Letitia? No. So Bartoff, he said, well, what did you do for all that money? It's like half a million bucks, man. That's a lot. What'd you do for all that money? He says, well, I reviewed hundreds of statements of financial condition over the years. That's obviously a lot. And he adds, you know, I've never seen, and speaking of these financial statements, by the way, Mr. Prosecutor, I've never seen a financial statement that provides so much details and is so transparent as this one. Trump's financial statements are tremendous. They are the best. They have a lot of information and you know what I mean, like a lot. And so it's very transparent, has everything that he needs. He says, you know, 
what? Let me just double down on that one. There is an awesome amount of information in them. That's why it took me so long to review them all. He says, you know, I've never even seen a statement that provided so much information as Trump's financial statements of condition. Trump's statements of financial condition. It is incredible. It's like, got, you know, Molly Gaston from the January 6th case would love it. There's like highlights in there. There is tabs in there. There's all sorts of other, you know, documents and roadmaps in there. It's like just a beautiful thing. Never seen anything like it. It's like even, it's like as beautiful as Mar-a-Lago if you've ever been there, worth $1.5 billion looking at the judge. So here, another defense expert called Jason Flemons, Adam points out for us, he argued that Trump's financial statements weren't fraudulent because they disclosed how unreliable they are. And Trump also made note of that, okay? In the statements of financial disclosure, there is a big disclaimer in there where he said, you shouldn't rely on these. Like, do your own due diligence. This is what I say I have, but don't take my word for it. Do your own due diligence. And guess what happened? The banks did that. And so he said that specifically, and that's like not even a complicated thing. So you see, this continues on, and it looks like that is near the end of the trial testimony. As we see Klasfeld reports, he said here, there were different valuations at different points throughout the trial, but the experts that Trump provided testified that real estate valuations were more of an art than a science, and Trump had wide latitude to make different projections on his financial statements, and that is not fraud. They also shifted the responsibility, they said, for scrutinizing those financial statements to accountants like other people. Now, we've had different people come in and testify. Flemons testified at a prior testimony. Giulietti also testified, and looks like he had a nice donut out there. So we have here an awesome amount of information. So Wallace interrupts a speech. This is the government. And says, will you stop? There's no question pending. He says, at some point, this witness must follow the rules like everybody else. So this guy's just talking. He loves to talk about us, but he's like, Trump's incredible. He was still going off this one. Awesome. He's like, it's really incredible. Like on page seven, I want to tell you the story about something that Trump put in his awesome financial statement. Guys, like, can you shut up? The judge instructs Bartov Engeron. He says, will you be quiet, please? Only answer the questions that are posed to him. And he looks over at Allison Greenfield. He's like, what do you think about that? I took control. You like that, don't you? So in an email from December 23rd, 2011, they show this email. They say, you recognize this, Eli? Looks like an email from Thomas Bowers, the ex-head of Deutsche Bank, the American Wealth Management Division, and said Trump had among the strongest personal balance sheets that he ever observed, along with the absence of personal debt and a huge asset base. He said, wow, looks, sounds like it's pretty good, pretty solid, pretty nice fortified financial statement and situation over there. Now, Adam had, looks like a Hanukkah sandwich today, so shout out, and says, delicious, by the way, afternoon recess. Now, he tells us that we're back after lunch and the attorney general's questioning continues. Now, they object to a line of questioning and the defense withdraws, they ask it differently. But he says, you know, the testimony here has been pretty problematic. The testimony from the afternoon session has been stop and go. Frequent objections from the AG's table. This guy's not an expert about this. This guy's not an expert about that. And the state also argues much of this is cumulative with the defense's other experts. We'll see if there are any other updates, my friends. That is Eli Bartov testifying, and we'll wrap up with the rest of it. We'll see where things finished off when we get a little bit more updates on what happened there in the courtroom. But this is Trump. They're fired up, blasting Tishy. Expert witnesses saying that these were the most awesome, incredible financial statements, tremendous that you've ever seen, and that there is no evidence of fraud at all. So that is Trump. This is New York. We'll be here continuing to follow this case and the rest of the Trump trials, my friends. Thank you for hitting that subscribe button and joining us as we do. And thank you for checking out robertgovea.com as well. If you want to read any PDFs that we go through here or sign up for our daily newsletter, robertgovea.com is the place to do that. We'll be looking forward to seeing you there and here on the next one.